Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the History of Awesome Podcast. I'm your host, Eric. And as always, my co-host, Daniel. Say hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, Dan. And since you know our next guest, would you please introduce him? Yes, of course. Our next guest is the prolific Dr. Gregory Downs, professor of history at UC Davis. Hello, professor, and welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see you again, Daniel. Good to see you too, sir. And it's fair to see, Professor, I've never had a chance to meet you, so I'm glad we can have this chat. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So, Professor, could you please introduce yourself? You know, where'd you get your, educa- where'd you get your degrees from? You know, what do you, what do you do? What are you doing right now? And also, what classes do you teach? Yeah, so I'm a professor of history at Davis, as you know, and um, and I study the 19th century United States, mostly sometimes in a comparative or international context. And at the heart of what I study is slavery, emancipation uh, during the period of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And so that confluence of, uh, of struggles um, over uh, who belongs in the, uh, who, has, who has a sense of belonging in the United States, who has access to power and rights, um, and how uh, the transformations of citizenship and access and of the economy during emancipation in turn raise the deepest questions about the nature and structure of the U.S. government. Um, so I got here, you know, most of the people to be a professor in history, I have a PhD, and I'm uh, no different. I have a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where I studied. I had done other work at, at one point. I was a fiction writer, and I have an MFA in, in fiction from the Iowa Writers Workshop, and, uh, and so on. And before this, I taught, oh, I forget, about eight years or so at uh, City College of New York and, and at the Graduate Center in New York City. So a flip coast to come to Davis about six years ago. Okay, and what classes do you teach? So I teach, that's right, I didn't answer that. So I teach 17A, which is the first half of our survey, uh, which is large introductory class. Um, And then I teach uh, 171B, which is uh, Civil War era, um, uh, which studies the coming of the Civil War, the political fights and and the war and emancipation during the war. Then I teach 171C, which is Reconstruction. I think we're the only campus in California that has a standalone class on Reconstruction. Uh, Sometimes I teach 180A, I think is the right number, which is the history of voting rights in the United States, which covers colonial to the present. Um, And then I teach undergraduate and graduate seminars, which change topics from year to year. So last time I did undergraduates, Let's see, I did slave rebellions a couple of years ago. Last year time I did California in the Age of Conquest so that we could go to archives in Sacramento. In um, the graduate seminar, I've taught a range of different things on 19th century and 18th, 19th century US. Okay, cool. So a lot of things about, you know, later half 19th century, also Civil War and Reconstruction, a lot of good things. Um, I study European history, so yeah. I didn't get a lot of chance to get in touch with a lot of the major kind of historical thinkings periods going on in there. Um, before we begin, so I'm at um, University of Buffalo. Um, do, oh, you know, great. do you know Carol Emberton? By I sense? sure do. I've known Carol Emberton since we were grad students together at Northwestern. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, in two, I met her in September 2001, so 20 years ago almost. Uh, she was a year ahead of me. I started, and I told you I got my PhD from University of Pennsylvania, but I had started our advisor. We have the same advisor was at Northwestern. So I started there and he moved uh, midway through to Penn. And so I actually finished at Penn. Um, but yeah, I've known Carol a long time. She's yeah. great. She's great yeah, historian. I, yeah, yeah, I had, um, so I'm, that's where I'm doing my grad studies right now. And I did a uh, graduate seminar with her on the, it was a research seminar on race. Yes, so, that's perfect. Yeah, I got my butt kicked a bit, but you know, I guess that's grad school for you. <laughs> that's good. It's got high standards, uh, but no, grad school. That's great. And Buffalo has a lot of really interesting historians. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so before we to begin, Dan, do you have anything else you want to add before we begin? Nope. I think it's all covered pretty well so far. Let's get into it. Okay, sounds good. So, Professor, I know we've talked about some things that you your research interests are. Um, kind of just kind of want to begin the podcast, be kind of with a little bit of a small anecdote of kind of how I've recently come into contact with how what people know about these uh, things you study. So, um, at the beginning of my uh, grad career, I did a I TA'd for um, the first part of U.S. history, 
And so it was kind of cool seeing kind of what the higher level view of the of that event is. And at the same time, too, um, uh, we had gotten to the part where we started about the Civil War and the after effects of that event as well. And so I was having a conversation with one of my roommates at the time. Um, he was a, I think he was a junior uh, studying engineering, I believe. And so I was talking about the Civil War about him, about with him. And he he basically said to me like, oh yeah, like the, um, yeah, slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War. Like it was all kind of like a, a separate thing. I was like, what, <laughs> are you kidding me? So I'm trying to tell him like all these things, like, you know, of all like the different uh, compromises that occurred over slavery, you know, the fact that like the uh, Emancipation Proclamation happened within the same event, like just trying to get him to, to, to have him understand this idea that, you know, you know, that's, you know, that's a big part thing that you're missing essentially, but I didn't push him too much because I didn't want to piss him off and have a bad roommate vibes or whatever. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, it's really interesting that this is still like a, a problem and something that people don't really understand. So uh, just to I'm kind gonna of jump in real go quick here. Go for it. Every single state's articles of secession also directly stated mm-hmm. yeah. that they were leaving due to slavery. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you look at any historical documentation, it makes zero sense that the, there's an yeah. argument against it. So, uh-huh. yeah, I, hopefully we can, through our conversations, we kind of, you know, come to understand why that's the case, why people have that misunderstanding. And so just to kind of begin the question, you can kind of react to what was what I just said, but to this question as well, you know, you know, what is the reduction and why I think it's important time in U.S. history to kind of understand? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Do you remember where your roommate was from? He was from New York. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Upstate New York, yeah. Yeah, upstate. So there are a lot of, uh, I, I do ask uh, students at Davis and I, and I um, there's a lot of, um, you know, I grew up partly in Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, there's a lot of, uh, and taught in New York City, there's a lot of variation across the country um, in how people would answer that question of was the Civil War about slavery? Um, it, it's strongest among white Southerners, the denial that it was about slavery. Um, But there's a really strong number of students at Davis, um, anecdotally, it seems to me, especially those who are from the Valley, who were taught in school that it was not, that it was about something else. Um, And it seems to me less so among some of the students from the coast, though that's a really broad generalization. Um, And many of the students, uh, you know, report that and report it as they they know that it was wrong, but it is what they were taught. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not, uh, not speaking about them but about the ways it's kept its hold. So in other words, one possibility is that your roommate, you know, just had particularly, uh, you know, roommates can think all kinds of things. So some <laughs> yeah, of them of tell us a lot of things about the world. Of course. And some of us tell them some things about their roommate. Um, and I don't have any comment on your roommate, but I do think it is interesting um, to um, reflect on how many people, how much uh, your roommate re- might represent a pretty large block. Uh, declining, but still a very large block. So from U.S. history is really shaped in, by many things, but among the central tensions of uh, how we understand U.S. history are the gap between what Daniel said and what you said. Mm-hmm. The historical record is really clear, yeah. and yet a lot of people don't believe it. So that, and, you know, sometimes that happens on relatively minor things, Mm -hmm. Um, but this is a big deal, right? This is, you know, one of the formative events in U.S. history and, you know, uh, you know, more, you know, with a, you know, 700, roughly 720,000 ish um, deaths, um, you know, more than most of our other wars combined, um, you know, transforms the constitution, of course, the emancipation of 4 million people. Uh, so all kinds of things seem to ride on it in our popular memory. And yet our popular memory is often really wrong. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for this, one of which is that two kind of uh, forms of amnesia. The first and the most consistent in U.S. history is amnesia about the role of African-Americans. Um, you know, so certainly I think most white Southerners are highly attuned to the existence of African-Americans, but amnesiac about their role as actors rather than as acted upon. And that's broader theme of U.S. history uh, that it's been often, you know, sort of this repeated portrayal of history as something that happens to African-Americans, not by and through. 
Mm -hmm. um, and in that context, forgetting the centrality of slavery, which can mean forgetting the importance of slavery to the economy, or it can mean forgetting the ways that enslaved people took action, both to undermine slavery and to join forces with the U.S. in the Civil War and you know, 180,000 in uniform of the U.S. Army, another 20,000 or so in the Navy. Uh, and, to, and then hundreds of other thousands go into U.S. lines to break down slavery and to bring the uh, Confederacy to its knees. So that's been one big form of amnesia. And that's an amnesia built into that, that goes back to the slave owners themselves who could have lived in this kind of contradiction. They recognized their enslaved people were people who had, you know, regular human reactions. They didn't think they were equal, but they, you know, we, we sometimes say they thought of them as beasts. That's actually something we tell ourselves because we want to think that if they saw them as people, they wouldn't do this to them. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, history is full of people who see other people as people and treat them, uh, you know, uh, monstrously. Um, so that's about us. They very often did refer to them as people, not as equal. And they understood, you know, the sort of range of human emotions. But they also practiced a kind of denial that enslaved people would ever revolt, that they, you know, could do something more, that they wanted to do something more. Um, and this denial was very profound in white Southern society. So that's one part and, and probably the most significant part of the amnesia. And the most significant thing that scholars, starting with people like George Washington Williams, who was a black U.S. veteran and politician and Civil War veteran, who began to compile these early records of black service in first the Revolutionary War and in the Civil War period. Um, and then throughout the 20th century, history first centered in African-American scholars and then slowly broadening out in the academy of what role are Black people playing and how are they not only recipients of history, but creators of history. That's one big form of amnesia and something history brings, but that's very hard to get through to popular consciousness. So it's, it's changing, it's shifting. The second is otter, which is an amnesia about the idea that the North meant it. And this is weird because the first part if you look from a satellite you know, image and said, here's a nation where you've got a, a population you know, of, uh, in the teens you know, of 20% or less um, that is treated you know, uh, completely unequally, how is that society going to deal with their history? You could actually make a lot of predictions going forward, right, you know, the, the, you know, about the absence. But if you said, and in this society, one of the largest groups fought a successful war that destroyed that institution. Do you think they celebrate it or not? You would say, well, of course they do, right? In fact, you would expect that the history of the United States would be told as if we didn't know anything that our amnesia was about the Confederacy. Yeah. And that we lived in a kind of triumphalism of the Union. And it's weird in certain ways that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, not just in the South, but even in the North. Now, certainly in the years after the war, there is absolutely, if you read through this kind of Northern triumphalism, they won because they were virtuous and they didn't mind saying it. Mm -hmm. That faded. In part, it faded um, because the gener that generation of veterans died off and their children were much less eager to say the Confederates were evil. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. part it happened because of the disfranchisement of African Americans. So Northern Republican politicians were no longer in an alliance with Southern African American politicians, where they, you know, got reminded of this centrality. Part of it is the early 20th century. We can kind of sometimes convince ourselves either that racism is something that started terrible and gets better, or it's something that's a flat line; it never changes. Mm. But in fact, it's uh, like other parts of history, it resists both of those narratives. And one of the oddities is that the early 1900s culturally seems a much more widespread racist moment than the, say, 1870s. Um, and so that many white Northerners catch that. By the early 20th century, we think of a kind of reconciliation project um, in which the deals of creating a national uh, you know, framework for understanding a, a expanding U.S. nation and the relationship of the Civil War to it involves white Southerners no longer saying the Confederacy should have won, 
And white Northerners acknowledge thinking that the Confederacy wasn't completely evil. Mm. And that meant black people disappearing. Mm. And so over the course of the US, mostly after the Civil War veterans are dying off, you see US textbooks and even in Northern states starting to kind of emerge into this consensus. They didn't teach that the Confederacy was right or secession was right, they're nationalist. But they did teach that it was an honorable part of US history. And to teach that, they had to make not only African-Americans disappear, but also the reason for the war disappear. And that meant, weirdly, we also lost touch of something you would think that uh, white Northerners would celebrate, that they were on the right side. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, over time, got either faded into just they were nationalists or it was just this thing that mysteriously happened. And then everybody, you know, acted in the face of a, of, a, of a seemingly meaningless conflict. And what's interesting is that that once it's unleashed, ideas spread all over the place. Mm-hmm. So once this gets out there, gets out there through uh, neo-Confederates and this oddity that people who said, Alexander Stevens says in 1861, slavery and white supremacy is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. 1867 to 68, after the war, he's publishing books that say the Civil War was about a constitutional disagreement and slavery was just incidental. The same people, they realize that they can no, once slavery is dead, they can no longer claim on the court of public opinion that it was about slavery. They start saying, well, slavery would have died anyway. Um, It was some other higher principle. Yeah. And what you see then is that amnesia um, coming out at first when they introduced this idea, white northerners really resisted and resent it. But over the early 20th century, it really spreads. And I'll finish with one last uh, anecdote and let you go to your next question. Probably the greatest or one of the two greatest Reconstruction historians, uh, Eric Foner, grew up on Long Island, uh, New York. And he uh, retells a story and he grew up in a family that was highly committed because they were tied to communist party related organizations. He knew Paul Robeson held him on his shoulders. He knew W.E.B. Du Bois, the, the other great, truly great reconstruction historian. And uh, Foner's family moved out to Long Island. He goes to a high school where they're taught that the Civil War wasn't about slavery and reconstruction was a mistake. And young Eric Foner, this is probably in the early 50s, goes to his teacher and says, you know, that's not really how I see it. I mean, he knew W.B. Du Bois, right? He was aware of other other possibilities. To her credit, the teacher says, why don't you teach it your way and let's see what the class thinks. So he goes in, prepares his lecture. His father and his uncle were both history professors. Uh, He had other uncles in trade unions and so on. uh, gives uh, Gives his class talk to the class. And the teacher says, so now you've heard two sides. Let's take a vote. Uh, which side do you agree with? And the tallies came back and it was 27 to two for the teacher. Oh, wow. Eric walks out. This is in New York, this is not in Alabama. Eric walks out and his best friend comes behind him and says, uh, hey, I didn't agree with you either, but I didn't want you to be all alone. So I voted for you. <laughs> so you convinced nobody. Which is to say that, yes, it emerges from the white South, but it's really peculiar how much the white North, even though this other model existed out there, what they called the treasury of virtue, the idea of the virtuous North, really gets subsumed even in the North. Uh, And that makes the Civil War kind of meaningless or just a way of reading character. Yeah. And so I think that brings up a lot of great points. And especially reading some of your work on Reconstruction, I can maybe see where that that maybe that amnesia could have came from. And I think that's something we can talk about next. So I know you've written a lot, a lot of books, which is really cool. Um, and so uh, so why did you kind of choose Reconstruction Civil War as like your point of focus for, you know, your career as an historian? What, what kind of got you there? It's a good question. Um, because there's lots of things to write about, right? Places, times, and uh, it's a virtue for historians to build up their knowledge, but it's also a virtue of, for them to work on different canvases. And uh, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, I have a lot of admiration for people who work in broader time periods, and, and I hope to live long enough to do that someday, but I'm not totally done with my fascination with Reconstruction. So I think there's two ways that people there's a few ways that people get into reconstruction. Um, One of which is uh, 
um, to understand that transformation of enslaved people into free people and what becomes possible. What's it mean for people to go like Robert Smalls from an enslaved person to a delegate to the Constitutional Convention to a congressman? That transformation, that sense of change, history is about change um, and that incredible change. The other related reason that people often get drawn to Reconstruction at first is, could it have been different? Mm. And that idea, which I think, you know, by then, you know, by my schooling, I was in Tennessee and Kentucky. I was aware, you know, of the, I was too young to have been, you know, I was born after all the desegregation. I was born in 1971. Um, but my mother and her family were certainly, you know, uh, remembered, you know, segregation. Um, we were upper South, so it was not quite the, the same form out in you know, a form that it would take in the deeper South. But certainly we're aware of it and aware of it, the ways that it broke, started to break down. Um, and the city that I went to high school in, which is not our hometown, it was Nashville, which was in the midst of uh, busing, had recently had bus, a major busing decision to desegregate. Um, and that had created a lot of anger and response and, and was really interesting time in retrospect to sort of be processing these. And seeing that sort of one form of a segregated society break down. Now, it might have entered a different form of segregation. I'm not saying it cre- ended with integration, I, but that form of a very rigidly, often in law society breaking down really raised the question for lots of people of, did it have to be that way? Mm-hmm. And so Reconstruction kind of existed often as this fantasy for more liberal Southerners that it could have been different. Mm-hmm. You know, look what happened then. Yeah. And that idea, was it possible? Could some kind of interracial coalition have happened in the 1870s? Was it possible that things wouldn't have ended in Jim Crow segregation and disfranchisement? And of course, history is always full of contingencies. It's always possible. But on the other hand, over the court, while I recognize and honor that romantic impulse, because I remember it and when I see it in others, I've also gotten much more interested in a histor- as, a, in, as a historian in some of the forces that make it, that made it very difficult to sustain. The idea of what if it could have been different then led people to say, well, if only, if only, if only. I'm much more skeptical of those if only stories uh, that it seems to me that the determination to reassert power by white Southerners was very broad, very widely held and essentially limitless, right? 50,000 murders, it's estimated of uh, African-Americans for political reasons in the 25 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, John Hope Franklin, a great scholar of of, um, the U.S., but especially of the transition of slavery into freedom, Mm -hmm. wrote, how does a society, you know, that our models, what we compare the South to are places with Black majorities. And to figure out how to remake a Southern society with a white majority that has more people, more money, more guns, more access to power, more communication, and a complete willingness to use all of those advantages. And a, I hate to say it, but a, not a unanimity, but an, un, a, an impressive amount, a depressing amount of cohesion. Really raise questions about, you know, whether, about how it could have been different. I do believe it could have been different, but I, as a scholar, I got into it in part out of the if only, Mm. And as a scholar, I've kind of worked my way more toward understanding why some of those if onlys are our inability to assess what was actually taking place at the time. Yeah. And I can definitely tell from reading your book, um, After Appomattox, uh, I think the rest of the title, uh, the Occupation oh, yeah. and the Ends of War. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. The Occupation and the Ends of War. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I definitely got that point of view from reading that book and a lot of the articles that kind of, uh, I think, uh, Around the circumference was the other one I read that kind of follows around that um, that type of viewpoint. So I wonder if we can kind of I know I might try to um, talk about other work that you've done, but I feel like after Appomattox kind of settles that kind of question you're talking about. Is, is would I be correct in that in that statement? Yeah, I don't think it settles. You know, historians <laughs> you always want to uh, it settles on it, but it doesn't yeah, settle in the sense of resolve. It. There's, there's always room for for debate, and of course, I always yeah. say if. Uh, 
you hope to close uh, a question, you're really putting the tombstone over it, right? Other people are going to enter it, and uh, but it, but it engages with it, and essentially it engages with the. Or you can go ahead and, and ask your question. Oh no, I was just going to say I think that I think that's one of the main focuses I got from reading your book, uh, reading that book, and what you just said right now. Um, and I'm just going to talk about that, and just maybe I'll, we'll introduce other stuff you've written, but I think that'll be the main focus of a lot of the podcasts in terms of reconstruction and civil war. So from what I got from it, um, you pretty much are trying to bring in this idea that, you know, reconstruction is kind of the thing that's overlooked. Like either we go quickly to the Gilded Age, right in the 1870s, or other times too, we think that, you know, once the war is over, that the Southern, uh, that the former Confederate troops kind of lay down their arms, that, you know, we're just going to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But in your type of viewpoint, you're trying to say that, well, it's almost kind of like the war kind of continued in the sense that, you know, in order to kind of bring about any idea of emancipation or freedom for in formerly enslaved uh, African-Americans, um, you know, there need to be, you know, has a war powers put in place to kind of, you know, what does I'm trying to say? So you need to, so if you want to bring in these new types of civil liberties, there needs to be some type of force bandit, some type of way to kind of enforce these rules. And I think that's kind of like what you're trying to do with this book, right? Kind of show what that means. Right. So, yes. So uh, you've done a good job summarizing it. Essentially, um, that Reconstruction uh, doesn't, you know, the power to make Reconstruction uh, come into effect depends on two powers meeting, one of which is this amazing grassroots movement by formerly enslaved people to register, to demand their rights. But the other is it meeting and getting access to a power that can really change those governments in the South and create openings. And that power depends on, as you said, the war not ending. The U.S. can't come in in normal times and just wipe out the government of California or order new elections, right? It can only do that in peacetime. And we, I think we've sort of lived in a little bit of amnesia. We built a vision of the reconstruction in which all the social democratic projects happen, but not their basis, not just in a general aftermath of war, but of war powers. And in some ways that reflects a moment in history um, where we have a sort of, a lot of academics, uh, you know, and I understand and live within both of these impulses are both for completely understandable reasons, extremely wary of war powers because of the way they've been utilized over the last well, a long time, but especially the last uh, 20 years, say. And yet also extremely hopeful of uh, broad-based uh, societal transformation. And so it's, we've separated those two. And my argument is it would be nice if it were so, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And that reconstruction depended upon powers that we wouldn't accept in normal times. And that when those powers are withdrawn, it itself starts to crumble. And that if we want to ask how could things have been different, we can't just ask generally, what if Northerners had more will or something like that? I, I, you know, we have to ask what power would there be? Mm -hmm. John Witt, a law professor at Yale, has written about this as well. And he has said, what do we do with the idea that Reconstruction depended upon occupation? Mm -hmm. And that as the hopes for occupation faded in different forms, so too did the potential for Reconstruction. And what does that tell us uh, about the challenges of making change democratically and the challenges of um, trying to create rights in a country that doesn't want to, where many people are fiercely committed to not recognizing them. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah. So I think one thing you talk about is, you know, uh, you know, how emancipation and what uh, freedom meant in this kind of context, how you kind of lay out this idea that, um, that when people think of the emancipation proclamation, I'll just read one point from it on page 42, you write, Slavery needed to be killed because it had not died. Although it is natural to think of Emancipation Proclamation as the end of slavery, its impact was limited to slaves who could reach U.S. forces. While the 13th Amendment passed Congress in early 1865, it had not been ratified by a sufficient number of states to join it to the Constitution. It says, therefore, slavery endured on the ground well after the end of fighting. Um, and you pretty much talk about how when the war ended, two things really. One is that um, the only way in which emancipation could kind of be kind of enforced was if there was Union troops to kind of be there and to kind of 
free the slaves. But once Union troops left, it's almost like the formerly enslaved people had nowhere else to go. Um, mm -hmm. Either they had to stay with the troops or, you know, they had just go back into their own lives. And even in certain places, um, even after the war ended, there was still slavery in lots of places. So I think in this, I think this is maybe one point that you try to show kind of what needed to be happened and what emancipation actually meant in this context, right? Yeah, so I think sometimes we can hope, and I understand this hope, that the world changes at the stroke of a pen. Um, and therefore, then our critique becomes, why aren't there more pens, more strokes, you know, that, that change the world? And this obscures two things, neither of which are, you know, which are which in some ways can be one thing. Um, one of which is where's the power uh, that there are, you know, and the second, which is related is, is there a mechanism for enforcement, which is a sort of, is there a way to make the power felt without having to show up with the police or the army all the time, right? And a bureaucratic enforcement is supposed to make uh, something come to be. Um, there are reasons we don't like either one of those frameworks. The first, whereas the power makes it clear that things that we like to talk of as questions of principle, which they are, still depend on force. The second, on bureaucracy, makes these high-minded questions really boring, right? Like, what did this subsecretary say to that assistant secretary, and how did that lead to... But that stuff really matters. And a lot of the work on the 20th century civil rights movement really emphasizes how much turns upon, um, A, the initial display of power, right? When to enforce a desegregation of Little Rock, Dwight Eisenhower calls in the 101st Airborne paratroopers from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, it's not a court order. It is a, you know, it is the use of troops. John F. Kennedy calls the U.S. forces into Oxford, Mississippi to desegregate the University of Mississippi. Um, and then it's finding some way that doesn't always lead to force, which is a bureaucracy. Um, and the fight over the bureaucracy in the Justice Department in the, from the 1960s to the to present day is really interesting because a lot rides on some small decisions in those areas. And my argument for the 19th century in some ways reflects, uh, you know, our, the effort to try and pull those things together. Um, if slavery is a recognition, not just a demand of freedom, but a recognition of freedom by someone who can reinforce your demand. In other words, it can't just be someone sitting passively, but also just saying I'm free doesn't end slavery. It requires this combination, this connection of a demand for freedom and an access to someone with the power to make it so. Well, the first question is, does anyone have the power to make it so? And in the immediate aftermath of surrender, it's clear that for many white Southerners, they don't believe that power exists and they continue. You know, I tell some of the stories, Lewis Hughes and others of people held in slavery months after the Confederate surrender. Um, the planters know about the Emancipation Proclamation. They don't care. Who's going to make them care? The U.S. Army sends troops out across the plantation. They occupy hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of county seats, but then they send detachments out to go to plantations to read the Emancipation Proclamation. We often interpret this as, some, as the slaves needing to be told they're free. But it's very clear if you read their own narratives that they've been talking about freedom for years. Mm -hmm. The people who need to know freedom have come are the masters. And that does require force, someone to say. So that question, how long, does, how long does it take white Southerners to give up slavery? What are the things they do to literally preserve it? I don't mean just inequality or oppression. And how much does it take to force that is one of the questions I wanna put on the table in part because it helps us go from what did reconstruction not do to what did it do? Mm. It's possible to get to 1865 and still imagine something much, much closer to slavery even than what endured being in place. And it takes that shock of recognition of force. But this next question is, as people, as white Southerners shift their strategies for resistance, how do you keep that force coming in? Or can you build a system strong enough that it creates a counterweight? Can you build a bureaucracy? And 
the Republicans never really succeed at building that bureaucracy, though they make efforts, but they're starting from nothing. There is no, uh, there is no Justice Department in the start of the Civil War. There's the Attorney General with the clerk and a few other clerks. They create a Justice Department, but it's nothing like the Justice Department that exists by the 1960s that has these bureaus that can build a, build a successful bureaucratic response. And still, as we see now, that's not necessarily enough. So I wanna try and recenter both our sense that slavery is not on the verge of dying, um, but instead is something that white settlers are holding on to, that it takes real force from both sides to tear it apart, and that one of the things we need to ask if we ask why inequality remained is to ask about a seemingly more boring question, both where did that power go? And, but then also seemingly more boring questions. What would it have taken bureaucratically to build a structure of freedom? And part of my argument is that we sometimes fall into believing that freedom happens independently of government. This is a sort of leftier version of what on the right wing is libertarianism. But there's a lot of this in, uh, starting in the 1960s, 70s on a kind of new left of an individualistic vision of uh, individual freedom from society. Um, and I think that that's an error. Um, I, I think that people become free in the arms of the state. I wrote an essay about that, that freedom happens because the government is there to protect uh, it from infringements. Um, and that it is not that we're in a state of freedom that the government intrudes upon, but the government creates our state of freedom. We might not like to think that as, you know, and, and especially people like professors who have a lot of relative, uh, not a lot of social status, but relatively, uh, you know, a relatively high amount of social status can convince themselves that their freedom is their own making. But I take for granted that a different government could enslave, uh, you know, that, that my PhD would not prevent, you know, a very different government in this context from, you know, enslaving people. Um, our freedom depends upon a government capable of defending it. And for a time that existed in the 1860s to maybe even the late 1880s, and then it did, or at least not in, in the ways that we would like. Yeah, um, I think also attached to that conversation you're having in the book is kind of what does freedom mean? I think on page 51, but you basically ask a bunch of questions, you know, like what does freedom mean? Does it mean that people could not be whipped by their employers? Was the right to testify a of freedom? You know, did freedom demand general comparisons of play and uh, or other questions you ask? And I think these are something that these uh, people who are in the bureaucratic system uh, of the government and within reconstruction are kind of having these types of questions. And it's a really a problem that they're kind of having, right. And trying to explain right. what to do. And can you could explain, you know, what those questions are and kind of how are they trying to unravel this? And maybe is there still, they ever ever solve these questions, I guess. That's a good question. So I would say that I would say it like this. Sometimes it gets told as um, people saying they hadn't thought about the terms of freedom. I don't think that's quite right. Or sometimes saying that they always imagined a constrained form of freedom. I would say it in a different context that from my point of view, a society addresses a problem and the solution to that problem reveals underlying additional further problems. And so in this sense, it's sort of built into a vision of um, my vision of history, that even in a time of progress, there remain problems to be solved. It's also probably related to my vision of, of, of human character, such as it is. Um, and that this isn't necessarily a sign of failure, that success opens the way to understanding challenges that hadn't been front and center. So one way of thinking about it is until slavery was killed, the questions of the exact terms of freedom couldn't be center stage because people understood that this was the crucial question. But I don't think that people weren't thinking about it. In fact, if you look at work on the antebellum North, where in fact there are discriminatory laws, some extremely discriminatory, exclusionary in some states, some uh, you know, different forms in other Northern states, that there's a battle going on about these discriminatory laws before the Civil War. So they're aware of it, 
Certainly African-Americans in those states are especially pushing this forward, but there's also finding allies in different Northern states to join these either to fight against exclusion, to fight against forms of discrimination and in some places to win, not always. So people are aware of this, but until they kill slavery, it's never gonna be the front and center. When you kill slavery, it makes it possible to be front and center. Now, once it's front and center, this question it, to me turns on a, in, on a couple of things. One of which is, is terms of freedom or degrees of freedom the right way to say it? I don't think so, because I think what we're looking at is not freedom, but equality. Hmm. And I think that freedom in this sense can cast a shadow over our way of understanding in which, again, the goal is to free them from the government. But as I said, that's not at all my sense of how either they understood it by and large, or some people differed, or we should understand the problem. The problem is how to build a structure of equality mm. that is powerful enough to overcome what Abraham Lincoln had diagnosed as the deep resistance to equality in white American public opinion. Mm. I see. That's not exactly the same thing as freedom, which is to say that you, because to make that the same thing as freedom makes it impossible to define what slavery was. So in other words, if we understand then what exactly does killing slavery do? It means that a person is not property. What does that mean? It means that legally, then you can't normally without certain exceptions buy and sell people. It means that legally they then can make basic contracts, which include a what at the time they defined as a fundamental basic contract of marriage. And then it means that they can, you know, that after emancipation, they can express power. Men can express power in all kinds of ways, some of which create backlash at the moment over wives and children means that they can purchase property, although there are some limits of that. And some of these clearly become forms of personhood that are different from men and women. Men have some different property rights than women, uh, depending on marital status and, and power. And then, you know, so there are things. So being equal means equal access to education. Being a slave means you are not allowed to get an education. They both matter but they're actually different problems, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't think of it as freedom, which seems to me to make then what is slavery is just a worse form of oppression. It's a different form of oppression, but to how do you construct equality? And here then you've got number of major obstacles. One of which is that equality is not nearly as popular as general anti-slavery. But there are people who sincerely hate slavery and want it destroyed who don't believe in equality. So now you've got a position with smaller support. You've got a position that is harder to define. Where does equality end? Are we talking about you know, strict legal equality? Are we talking about political equality? Are we talking about social equality in the terms they used for it? And how do you build a structure that's capable, even if you can get will for it, how do you build a structure that's capable of defending it in places where it's not popular? In other words, even if you can get a national consensus behind it, there are gonna be places where it's gonna be hard. And how do you build that structure? So you get disagreements on what it should be, and you also get a lot of confusion about, about, you know, about A, is equality good? B, what does equality mean? C, how does equality get defined? And you've got a hardcore group of people who are very determined to resist. And in that context, where you've got a nebulous and ill-defined uh, you know, group without a necessarily a clear unifying agenda against a group with an absolute limitless commitment to an agenda, it's really hard to prevail. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I think when people think of freedom or these ideas, people have like, the people believe like there's like this general idea of what freedom is. But in reality, once you get down to the bare bones and start asking those questions, what that actual definition means really changes and really is not a very unanimous type of idea, I think. Um, and it's not just that people disagree. Yeah. It's that it moves. Mm 
Mm. So even the same people don't think the same thing all, <laughs> all the time. And that's okay. It's this nebulous term that we use as a signifier of something we hold as value. And I think the best historians have said freedom is powerful, not because we agree on it, but because it's the thing we agree to fight about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other and- countries have other unifying terms, which I mean, not that they agree on it, but they agree that that's the fight that matters. Oh, yeah. Most, I mean, when we're talking about this, I think about the French Revolution being like the most, for me, at least the most interesting cause, because everyone's like freedom. But then you have like three governments that are like have their own definitions of freedom. And in that type of event, you have I think it shows very well. But I think what you're showing here also continues that conversation as well. Um, and people are interested. It's easy to overgeneralize in the idea of France as a place with the shape, you know, egalite, which is not, you know, a central part of the slogans, uh, you know, or nearly a central part of the American slogans, right? And is there a kind of sense of equality versus freedom in, in ways people in a very, from, you know, far off in space, read some of the differences in U.S. and French history? Um, Most definitely. Uh, Dan, do you got anything else to add before we move on? Yeah, just a real quick anecdote on a previous, um, sorry, not an anecdote, a statistic from a previous com- point in the conversation. Um, the percentages of people who believe the Civil War was caused by state rights versus slavery. Uh, as of 2011, roughly 48% of Americans said it was states' rights, while 9% said it was equally states' rights and slavery. And as of 2018, the numbers have fallen roughly 1% in each of those categories. It is going down just very slowly. <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting. No, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, we got it. We get, we're, hopefully this podcast will help kick into that number for a lot better. Um, so one of the questions I have next is kind of um, in this part, we talked, we, we introduced this idea that, you know, just because the war ended doesn't, just because the civil war ended doesn't mean that the actual like fighting or any type of feeling of fighting happened. Um, so my question is, is that um, on page 11, you write, the end of the battles did not end the occupation of the rebel states. Surrender marked a turning point, not an end point for the state of war. Well, battlefield fighting would close over April and May 1865, wartime did not. So you can tell me if I'm kind of going off out of bounds with this question, but kind of reading this and kind of reading how, you know, the North tried to use war power, such as similar types of laws to use during the Civil War, like the expulsion of habeas corpus, you know, basically kicking out any government they want and overturning courts and other stuff like that. And kind of the actual military conflict that did take place, the fact that you know, they had to chase down, you know, these uh, Confederate guerrillas who were fighting in, or formerly Confederate guerrillas who were fighting the Northern government forces or other forms of uh, political violence that are happening in it. Um, do you think the term, I don't, this has something I think, but coming from my point of view, does the term reconstruction actually mean anything? And what I'm trying to say is the term reconstruction disregard the kind of military action taken by the Northern government, even after the actual fighting happened, um, you know, with all animosity between the Northern and Southern states. Um, what do you think on that point? Do you think that's too far to bounds? Or do you think there's something to it? For what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that, um, well, reconstruction means something. People did use it at the time. Whether what it means and whether we should keep using it or what we should use it for, I think, are, uh, you know, are, 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 are other questions that you accurately grasp. Uh, that you accurately pinpoint some of the reasons for asking. So I would say it like this. One of the dangers of Reconstruction is that it separates a noble war from a you know, confusing or a ignoble Reconstruction in the worst lost cause vision of it. Um, the second is that uh, as that got inverted, from you know, a readings that sort of let's brush past the war, the good stuff starts with reconstruction. We got a positive reading of reconstruction that itself was cut off from its rootedness, as we've already talked about, in the tools and powers of war. And so we created, on the one hand, a vision of reconstruction as the bad contrast to the war. On the other hand, reconstruction is the good, you know, democratic triumph over, you know, the sort of un- un- queasy things that make us queasy about the war itself. 
And both of those differentiations, I think, uh, of course, I think the second differentiation is a lot better than the first, mm -hmm. but they both uh, mislead us about what happened. And so that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, that I'm interested in pulling out the idea of the stages of the war. From other perspectives, scholars with somewhat complementary, but, you know, not entirely, which is good, uh, views have emphasized not a long civil war in terms of, uh, you know, accepting that war is armies, not just power, but a long insurgency. And so of really thinking of a white Southern militaristic, but not uniformed uh, commitment to insurgency against U.S. aims from surrender through at least the 1950s or 1960s, taking different forms, trying different strategies, and this being a really important um, thing to, uh, to contemplate. So I think, um, you know, that, that thinking about that, that A, um, reconstruction depends upon war powers. Mm. B, the fighting of the war doesn't continue in exactly the same way in reconstruction, but there are interesting continuities and a immediate burst of violence at the, at the war's end. Um, so um, for those reasons, I think I am persuaded that, you know, we need to be really thoughtful about what we mean by reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, scholars have pushed and pulled on it. One of the things that's interesting about reconstruction is that it's such a malleable word. So you can see it all over the place. Kate Mazur and I wrote about this sort of, you know, in literary studies and this and that reconstruction of everything. And in that context, it can be unclear what reconstruction means. Um, Rachel St. John in our department, a wonderful 19th century historian who focuses on borderlands in the West, has written that she will, you know, about the utility of confining Reconstruction to the powers over the South, in part because of what's happening in the West, while somewhat related, doesn't proceed in the same sets of powers and authorities and has different trajectories. Uh, so against what sometimes gets called a greater Reconstruction. Um, of the whole country. Um, we floated the idea, Kate and I, of post-war. What would it mean to think of a period which itself doesn't work so well with apobatics, but of a long period like you can see in European histories and so on, of understanding a long period of unsettlement um, after a war? And what would it mean to think about that with what we canonically think of as reconstruction, the power over the South being one piece of a broader post-war remaking or reimagining? Um, so there's lots of different ways to play with it. I do think there's utility in reconstruction, um, but not in it becoming either an all-purpose word or the only word. Yeah, yeah, I, I can totally see that. And I think just kind of reading that point coming from that view kind of, I think also shows this idea that like, like just because of history is just a word or whatever, there's just, there's a lot more meaning to it. There's a lot more kind of conceptualization, a lot more kind of, if you focus on it, you find a lot more interesting things about what that term means and not just being a word or whatever. Um, and I think one thing you just brought up right now is kind of looking towards um, other histories and not just American history. And I know that's something you've started to do in your most recent work. And something you look at in this work as well, looking at how other, um, you say that one thing is um, occupation is not a science that always is going to work. And if you look at within the 19th century context, especially when you look at other European powers, either in Asia, in their colonies or in or imperial holdings or in, uh, let's say, um, Irish, England or all these different places, how you find or I'll show you there's another one that is a thing that's is really difficult within the 19th century. And it's one of the reasons why reconstruction was not able to be as successful as it is. So my question is, um, can you speak to that? And at the same time too, why do you think that looking at more transnational viewpoint is important for American historians to kind of take a more global view um, in your perception? Yeah, one thing is, um, it's, it's easy to get blinders on. And some of this is the particular blinders of, of US culture, right? As a Unsu you know, as, uh, not totally surprisingly, as the most powerful country, at least for now in the world, that I would guess that the countries that are the most powerful generally have less curiosity about the world than other countries do. And, and, and so I don't think it's solely unique to U.S. culture. Um, and then there's another piece of it, which is certainly not unique to the U.S., but is profound, which is that inside of countries, the study of that country is always very different than the study of every other place in the world because it operates in a different way. Mm 
So we experience this in US that US historians can seem internalist or speaking to sometimes sort of old fashioned concerns. But in fact, if you look at England, that they have the same, you know, sort of dilemmas and breaks between people who study England or Britain and the rest of the world, in France, the same, that every country wrestles with these two things. What is the purpose of studying the world versus what is the purpose of studying one's own country? And that this is tied into the historic way that history has been part of historic way history. That is a terrible phrase. Uh, but the uh, you know, way that history has been um, a part of trying to develop a sense of identity. And historians have been really, you know, in the ways that the imagined community of identity um, happens in part for a nation through the past. Now, historians are really wary of this now. Um, because we're much more attuned to the problems of nationalism. But yet there remains a huge demand for engagement with national identity. In some ways, that's what you started with. What was the Civil War about? It's a different question in the U.S. than almost any other historical question because it's a question about who the United States is or, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna say we, because not all of your listeners are gonna be, you know, members of the United States and that's, that's fine. Uh, it's good to, uh, you know, but so that's, that's a central question. Historians kind of have this dual dilemma. There are things people really worry about about the past, but those things often speak to national identity or sometimes regional identity. If we ignore them, then we leave it to other people. You don't need a license to practice history. Mm -hmm. If we engage with them, we replicate that creation of identity problem. Yeah. In that context, I think having, I don't favor leaving aside. Some historians kind of look down on treating anything, you know, but then we're, we're leaving the field to, to people who don't know. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I do think it's really important that we get out of our silos and engage with the ways that U.S. history looks from other parts of the world, both how other people at the time understand U.S. history and also how historians elsewhere think about the history of the moment. And here's, and here's why I think it's necessary, not just virtuous, but necessary. It's very easy within a history to develop a set of answers that are specific only to the, this happened in the U.S. because of this thing that's specific to the U.S. But then you look around and you're like, but wait, what happened in the U.S. is happening in lots of other places. So a U.S. specific answer can't be right. Logically, it can't explain why the U.S. is just like every other place, right? That, uh, that the answer is because the U.S. is different than other, every other place. Logically, that can't be right. We've seen this in slavery where answers about the U.S. about national identity and slavery get messed up the moment, you know, over the last 50, 60 years, however many, that scholars start really saying, but wait, in what ways is U.S. slavery very much like other forms of Atlantic slavery? And if that's the case, what if the answer is not something about the U.S., but something about European imperialism, the Atlantic world, etc.? Same thing can happen in civil war and reconstruction. The U.S. is not the only country to have a civil war. Um, there's interesting things to say, the tiny one in Switzerland, the unbelievably vast one in China at the roughly the same time. Um, you know, other, uh, you know, how much does it make sense to think of some of the 1848 rebellions as in part civil wars? Um, you know, what should we think of 1848 in France uh, or 1870 to 71 in France? Should they be parts of civil wars? Why do we name things one way or the other? We start to ask that we can lose some of our sense that um, the answers in the U.S. are always going to be solely about the U.S. And then if we ask some questions, OK, how does emancipation work elsewhere? If we want to know, uh, what can we learn from that? One of the really depressing things we learned from that is that emancipation is extremely challenging everywhere and often even more limited. Uh, Steve Hahn, who trained me and Professor Amberton, who you mentioned, uh, wrote an essay about that the landowners in Prussia and Brazil actually ended up more powerful at the end of their emancipations than before. And in this context, the U.S. Southern slave owners end up less powerful than some of the analogous large landowners. In other words, that many societies are going through a 19th century question of how powerful should lords of the land be, especially when they control labor. Mm 
In the U.S. context, they get more marginalized. We are understandably outraged that they're not more mar marginalized. I'm for that. But we don't really understand what's going on if we don't understand, say, for example, the way that other slaveholders in other places actually end up with more economic and political power at the end of emancipation. Mm -hmm. That also means we don't really understand why the U.S. slave owners fought if we don't understand why so many other slave owners took a deal. So in this sense, it can lead you back to the question of what makes the U.S. different, but on much firmer ground. What about the U.S. actually is different? And what do we need to be looking for when we're asking for U.S.-specific answers? We want to make sure our U.S.-specific answers are answering questions that are actually about how the U.S. is different. And yeah, that is something I, because I recently just took a class on um, uh, like America, I forgot what the class school, but it's basically looking at these transnational American histories. And it was kind of interesting coming from me because I, I guess I didn't know how much American history was just so isolated. And that's just coming from me from a European perspective where I feel like you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but like European perspective is more willing to engage with other national histories. I think maybe U.S. history is just starting to kind of come up and starting to interact with this uh, form of history. Um, but that's kind of what I just think. But um, an interesting note you, you kind of make is uh, I was reading a book on um, – basically how historians have looked at both the American and French revolutions and was author, I don't, I couldn't find the original quote, but he quotes, um, I believe it's John Adams. Uh, this is a quote from John Adams when he was in, I think it was like constitutional convention, kind of French revolution time era. He basically says that um, Americans, Adams repeatedly said, were no different from and no better than Europeans. There is no special providence for Americans and their nature is the same as that of others. I think it kind of calls in this idea that the United States, people back then knew they were in a globalized world. So Very why should much. we as historians start to put upon this idea that they're isolated? And That's right. Bring about this conversation. Um, I think, you know, European historians have lots to answer for in their own limitations, which is true. But they've always had to be much more attuned to the idea of the presence of other nations than <laughs> U.S. historians are because they're right there and they're often, you know, at war with them. Yeah. And the relative isolation of the United States um, and especially the relative isolation of the East Coast of the United States from from other nations um, has, uh, you know, certainly plays plays a role in, in this in this that even it is true. French historians can be very insular, but they're also always have their eye out for what Germany and Britain. <laughs> are doing. Exactly, exactly. Um, Dan, do you have anything else to add or are you ready to get, move on? Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. I was also going to add, though, that uh, America being the hegemon uh, for the last roughly 60, 70 years has also helped in their, their the notion that we don't need to look at what everyone else is doing. We need to look at what the other two big players, three big players in the world are doing. And that's kind of it. Everyone else is kind of irrelevant from our perspective mm -hmm. due to you know our relative strength to them is mm -hmm. i guess why they might also be looking more insular for a lot of our historical questions yeah, yeah. a lot of modern what's it called historians kind of write within their present perceptions so exactly. it's like to say historians don't live don't historians don't live in a bubble or we kind of interact mm -hmm. with our social world around us and our political world around us which Definitely important to recognize our biases, of course. Um, so kind of getting towards the end of kind of talking about reconstruction of the Civil War. So I think one thing you brought up was this idea, you know, could reconstruction have succeeded and couldn't have failed? Um, so kind of connected to that type of question. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that with the reason the social level of social injustice in the United States that's been championed most recently by the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the Civil Rights Movement, how much of these issues exist? due to the failure of reconstruction and could these failures have been avoided and connected to that, was there anything good that came from reconstruction, even if it did fail? So there's a couple, I pull that apart in a couple of ways. Go for it. One of which is, uh, did reconstruction succeed or fail? B, two is, you know, are we now working within the limits of reconstruction? Uh, three, um, do we imagine an outcome that would have made some of the movements you talked about not just different, but unnecessary? 
Yeah. Um, so let me start at the, the last one. I think I take the existence of groups like the Movement for Black Lives and, and other sort of related movements as a, not as a sign of failure, but as a sign of a certain kind of success, which is a success in articulating a position um, that really emerges from a reading of a world now that they see is articulating different positions than that of the 50s and 60s. And I think this is also partly why there's some, mm, I don't want to say friction, but difference between uh, Movement for Black Lives uh, activists and some of the older, you know, uh, lions of the civil rights movement. Um, in essence, in some ways, I think people have struggled to define, have recognized the limits of the 1960s, 70s model for a different world, and have struggled to find a, a new way of saying it and a way that spoke to not just a new slogan, but a new way of diagnosing the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think the movement for Black Lives has. And um, that's something I would be tempted to see as a sign of their success in reading the world around them. And actually in reading specifically the world of the 21st century, right? Uh, in essence, I might, to me, the question is not why didn't the civil rights movement people define it exactly in the way that Black Lives Matter does. I would be more interested as a historian in how did CRM people respond to the specific world of the 50s and 60s? And how is it that BLM people are responding to a specific world of the early 21st century? Um, and, uh, you know, that, that when you're out of joint, when you're using things built for one moment for a different moment, they have this kind of venerable, honorable quality, but often they don't resonate um, because people are reading words, not just do they sound good, but do they fit the world around them? It's very obvious that Movement for Black Lives has succeeded in developing a vocabulary that for many people does seem to help them interpret the world around them. Um, and some of that, of course, draws on upon things that exist in the 1960s. Some of it draws on things that exist in the 1860s. And that goes to your second question about to what degree is the movement for Black Lives trying to resolve the issues of Reconstruction? Uh, so I don't want to say if Reconstruction had gone better, there wouldn't be a movement for Black Lives. Um, because I think its goals are very broad and we should respect that. And some of its goals would actually be things that many Reconstruction leaders would not, even the most radical would not have endorsed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, much of the Reconstruction leadership emerged, including many of the most radical people, in a moment in American capitalism where there was real wrestling with um, questions of how to pull people into capitalist markets of people who saw the problems of slavery as preventing people from having access, which in certain literal way is true, even as it makes enslaved people commodities in capitalism. Um, and a weariness of the power of what Richard White called monopolistic power over different forms of society and an eagerness to break that down. And that's why some of the most radical aspects of Reconstruction involve something that's, uh, you know, you can read in different ways, which is breaking up of land into small farms. At one level, this can read as a sort of revival of the Jeffersonian dream, not a radical in its actual implications, but not actually radical in American history. Now, Jefferson didn't have this dream for Black people, to be clear, but the dream, and he didn't enforce it for whites even, right? You know, that Louisiana Purchase gets portioned out in ways that favor large-scale slave owners. But the idea that small a nation rooted in small farming is strong is a very powerful 19th century idea. You can make some connections. Now, so the, there's some divisions in the most radical wing of Reconstruction of people who perceive that this is to train, give people the access to be commercial farmers versus some people whose actions suggest the goal is a kind of subsistence farming. And that's a very different view of the market. You can make some sort of very abstract connections to some of the broader economic goals. It is redistributive. Yes, but lots of things are redistributive. It's redistributive in a way that fit the 19th century. 
If it had happened, other things would have happened and those would have had interesting consequences. And yet I still also think we would have and need to have social movements in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that there's a utopia that we get to and then get to hit pause, right? You know, it goes back to what I said before, success reveals new problems. Mm-hmm. And then changes in the world reveal other problems and failure reveals other problems. Human experience is to live in problems that you're trying to figure out how to solve and how to get support for solving them. So I don't think there's a button you push there and then now all we do is sit back and you know sip our amazing lattes or whatever, right? Like, uh, yeah, I understand that impulse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other piece I think that's really hard to separate is could reconstruction have defeated racism? Mm -hmm. That's really what's being asked. Uh, If it wasn't a racist society, that I think is putting a burden on reconstruction that is almost impossible. Um, The things that have not defeated racism in the United States is a pretty impressive list. Uh, you know, some of which are things that had lots of value in lots of other ways, some of which were things that really were focused on it and did not. It may well be, to go back to our previous conversation, some of these things really are much less about the U.S. than we might think. That the degrees of, you know, th- that we'd have to really engage to say, you know, what can be defeated in a human society do we have models for with the kind of different ways that different societies over the 19th and 20th century distinguished people, some of which we would call racism, some not, but some of which serve quite similar functions, how those things have changed, what has happened as those societies have faced new groups of people. Um, We often contrast the United States to societies that, from my perspective, seem frankly xenophobic. Mm -hmm. That seems weird, right? Like, uh, you know, that the, you know, uh, the, the, the model societies they point to are often societies that right now are sites of much more intense xen- and popular xenophobia even in the United States. Xenophobia is different than racism, but we might, it might help us get some caution about the idea that there's ever a moment where it's every form of differentiation is killed. Now there are specific aspects to the anti-black racism that are powerful, insidious, and particularly hard to kill, even though they change. And that's, it's really interesting if you can not say, could reconstruction have destroyed anti-black racism, could it have changed it? That's a really more possible question. Right. In other words, could have some way created an alter and, you know, alter, you know, a disturbance in the universe. Things would have been different. How different? In what ways? Hard to know. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the solutions are ways that would have had it be really hard to predict the reason, the impact. Um, There were Republicans over the course of the 1860s, 1870s, as they start to see the overthrow of Reconstruction who say what we need is a place of black self-governance. Is that radical or is it relatively conservative? Mm -hmm. Kind of depends how you see it. So they imagine turning over Florida, which at the time was not nearly as inhabited as it later would be, or Oklahoma, which was extremely inhabited, but by native tribes, or the Dominican Republic, which the Grant administration tried to purchase in part for this reason, as a place where black power would be established from the beginning. That would have changed things. Would it have made it even easier to discriminate against African-Americans and the white states? Would it have created white states and black states? What would that have meant? Or would it have created a counterweight where the presence of black people in positions of power in those states would have been a counterweight? I don't know. It would have made things different. But what I mean to say is all of the radical solutions that we can imagine would have made things different. And yet it's also probably too big a burden on them to say, would it have killed slavery or all forms and and racism or all forms of ways of of grouping opposition. Some of that seems really sticky, specifically in anti-black racism in the US and also sticky in more generic terms in other societies. So in this context, Reconstruction solved a number of things and in the process introduced a lot of problems. And then some of the things that it seemed to have solved got undone and overthrown. That might not be its failure. That it's, that's it getting overthrown. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a mix of those. And so, um, yeah, so I think one things I, one things I like you bring about is kind of bring away this idea that just because Johnson became president, Lincoln uh, did not become president is because is the reason why uh, Reconstruction failed. On page 64, you write, the tendency to treat racism as not merely evil, but uniquely powerful in explaining American history also fed overconfident judgments about Johnson's effectiveness in restraining Reconstruction. But Johnson was neither as important nor as single-minded as those narratives suggest. To a surprising degree, Johnson regularly sustained the military throughout 1865 and even into 1866. The white Southern insurgency that would stymie Reconstruction was not the product of Johnson's actions nor his decisions so uniformly opposed to military power and the creation of black civil rights. And at last, you write... Uh, there is not one but a thousand roads to grief. And I like this because you kind of bring in this idea. It's not just like one, per if like, if one thing happened in history, then everything would have changed. You're trying to show that there's a lot more, it's a more complicated and more type of, a lot more inputs being put in this situation that you get the kind of output from what you get for reconstruction. So um, I, that's kind of what I like from, I think that's, oh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that's kind of showing, you know, why reconstruction probably failed multiple things not just one person's fault i guess yeah i mean i don't like the word failure because it did ending slavery wasn't guaranteed that's a big deal establishing yeah. certain basic rights um once you establish those then of course it's natural to focus on the next ones and that's right but if you don't have basic rights to property that would have been you know in other words it's what we take for granted of reconstruction to say it failed we have to take for granted all that actually remained and I think at the same time, um, too, sorry if I can cut you off. I know. So basically, yeah, yeah. on 247, um, I think in your conclusion, you basically say that while it didn't create everything we would have wanted, there was some stuff created. Like you say that now people who were formerly enslaved, even though unfortunately they were uh, murdered at a much higher rate after the Civil War ended, but they were given like public spaces uh, to kind of set up political demands or to kind of take up, you know, even some government positions. I think you mentioned one formerly enslaved person becomes a part of the House of Representatives, I believe. Um, so that's something that did not occur before the Civil War and Reconstruction began, but it's something that did was created after. So I guess good right. thing and a bad thing, right? So that there's, you know, A, I think on your you know, prior question, we've mostly gotten past the great man theory of history, but we sometimes like the bad man theory of history, right? You know, that people, and there are lots of bad factors in history. Uh, and Andrew Johnson's certainly one of them. But it's not as clear to me which of those people are quite as important. And mm -hmm. it sometimes seems to me we ascribe a lot of importance in order to not deal with the underlying issues. And that, I think, reflects something that we're not particularly good at as historians and maybe as a society, which is helping to train people toward the kind of engineering side of government. Not how do you think right, but how do you make things different? Mm -hmm. And not just how do you make things different by pushing a movement, but OK, you succeed. Now what? we've kind of ceded that to other social sciences, political science and others. And in some ways that's fine, but in other ways it's really a mistake from our part, right? That we're kind of training people to think that these moments of claiming a power are really important, but then what you do with it is not that important. That's crazy, right? Like we gotta train people, you know, to seize power and to use it to good ends, right? Uh, as they see it, not as I see it, that's fine. Um, and so we've kind of reflected that in our own historical work, which often shows a kind of lack of interest in how do things actually happen? Um, and, you know, why? And, and so within lacking that knowledge or interest, we focus on questions of it might have been. But sometimes it's in the, it's in the details. Um, yeah, the things that we can lose track of. Uh, the numbers, I mean, there are the numbers of families that are um, separated in 1861 and are together over by the late 1860s, some of which never get, re you know, there's amazing work, Heather Williams and others on people trying to find lost family members in the 1880s, 1890s, but, by, but many families coming together. Property acquisition, right, which is crucial for people's independence, nowhere near equality, but staggering growth in some areas, really uh, staggering growth in the number of Black people who own land, 
relative to the incredibly small number before the war. Education levels transformed dramatically. Again, if the bar, if the ground is equality, no. But if the ground is a comparative shift, it's clear that from 1860 to 1900 is a period of dramatic transformations in African-American economic, educational, familial life, mm -hmm. associational life, right? And small number of churches, mostly controlled by whites to, and then informal meetings all over the place to huge numbers of clubs and churches and this associational life. Those are big deals. And it's the work of building up these capacities for property rights, even if they're unfairly applied, that do create these kind of leverages. And that allows us then to see how they're not applied equally. But without the right, we wouldn't even be aware of how they're not applied equally. So I don't, I do resist the idea that reconstruction fails. It fails, if it certainly, you know, is overthrown. It certainly doesn't address everything it could. Some of the things it does address are destroyed later on. Um, but it also achieves these dramatic transformations. Okay. Um, we're about to the next part. So, but uh, Dan, um, any other questions or thoughts you had? No, I think we're good. Okay. Um, so we talked a lot about, you know, your how you got into reconstruction, you know, the... Um, you know, how you got to that. But my question is kind of more generally, you know, um, how did you get into history and why did you choose a, a, as a, a historian as a profession? You... Yeah, so I uh, got into history, just I grew up between Hawaii and the South where, I, you know, um, and so I was highly aware that they had very different trajectories and they were very different places, not just climactically. Um, and um, I, um, was always interested in the sense of the depth of the presence of the past in Kentucky, especially where I have lots of family. Um, and there's, you know, the kind of ways that myths of it played. The town I'm from was a unionist town where a lot of people imagined, their children imagined that they had been Confederates. Um, that, you know, the joke about Kentucky is it waited to secede until after Appomattox, right? That more Kentuckians fought for the Union, but its identity became much more Southern after the war, which is very strange. So Kentucky supports, you know, uh, the Unionists, uh, more Kentuckians fight for the Union than for the Confederacy. But after the war, it elects uh, almost exclusively former Confederate officers as governor. And so weird things are happening. And you could see that around in these sort of odd myths and legends that, that spread that, um, you know, became aware of as a kid that they didn't really match the town. Our hometown had been attacked by Confederates. People often mistold that as if it were attacked by the U.S. Um, but it was a Unionist town the Confederates raided. And, and so there's all these kind of weird um, mistakes about the past. And yet an assertion that the past really mattered. Uh, and it certainly does seem true um, that black and white Southerners on the aggregate in generality have a strong belief the past matters and often divergent beliefs about what it tells us and why. And that this divergence is important and yet also the shared sense that the past really matters. Because when you contrast with other part regions of the country that I've taught in, there's often an uncertainty about whether the past actually does matter, right? Uh, you know, the, you know um, in this sense, the sort of um, gleaming present of California or the sort of centrality of a kind of futurism about to be made on the coast um, can be a kind of large scale lack of interest in the South, in the past, not in the South, but in the past. And that's different. The south, Southern view certainly leads to lots of propaganda, but it weirdly it's propaganda that makes an argument for history, even as it makes it through incredibly bad history. <laughs> and the self image on the coast can often be much more detached from history or make history seem much more esoteric or less pressing. That makes it easier in a sense uh, that you're not fighting against quite as many entrenched mouths but harder in the sense that you have to explain why the past matters. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, uh, there's the, you know, so coming from a society that seemed obsessed with the past and especially that past, 
slavery, emancipation, civil war, reconstruction. Uh, at first, I thought I'd be a writer. You know, I mentioned I went to grad school in writing. I published a book of short stories in which I have historical themes. They're not historical fiction, um, but many of which are about that reckoning with the past. Um, and then I moved back into history, which had been my undergraduate major, um, you know, as a, because I got really interested in building up my knowledge and understanding more what was possible in the kind of writing of history in a way that I hadn't understood as an undergraduate and that fulfilled some of the things I liked about writing. Um, so eventually went to get a PhD, you know, because I, you know, saw it as the clearest way that I could retain my interest in writing and, and, and my interest in the past. Um, and because I got really interested over time in not just the broad historical questions about is the lost cause true or not, or the kind of things that lead people in, but in some of the internal questions that the debate historians have, I find incredibly interesting and fulfilling to be a part of, even though it often is among people who've already resolved those issues that, you know, as a 17 year old, I thought were so pressing. Yeah. And I think one interesting thing, because I know you've kind of started your, you, you've one part of your career was writing and stuff like that. And one of the things I've found is when I've kind of talked to undergraduate students about history, most of them think about, you know, like how many facts do I have to know or how many this, but in reality, I feel like as historians, we're just kind of telling stories, but the kind of ways we're telling our stories is not just from our own imagination, but from like, like uh, other sorts of forces and that types of facts. So I guess, would you say that's one thing that also kind of got you into history is that you're able to kind of tell stories but maybe kind of different types of stories than what you can as a literary writer, maybe? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap and then some obvious differences, right? We don't make things up. That's a big one, right? Yeah, of course. Um, we aren't I think, supposed to make things up. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I think a lot of uh, people who either read or write more in creative forms would say sometimes that we become wary as historians of deeper truths. That's probably true. We're more cautious. Even when we pat ourselves on the back for being daring, we're, we're more cautious, not just in fiction writers, but then more creative nonfiction and, and other forms of long form nonfiction writing. Um, partly that's because we have a different vision of our audience. Uh, and that's often described in a negative way. But I actually think one of the things that's magical about writing in academic history is you're writing for people who know lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. and that means you've got to raise your game. It's like you got <laughs> called up to a higher court, right? Like stuff I could get away with, uh, with an audience that doesn't know much, I'm not going to get away with. That makes me better. Similarly, saying something interesting to someone who doesn't know much about a topic versus saying something interesting to someone who knows a lot, I've got to be pushing myself much harder. Um, so it's true we give up a kind of audience that's available for other things, but it's also and that we lose some creativity in wanting to speak to that audience that has those expectations. But we also, at some level, get an even different and in some ways harder challenge. I don't know that it's harder than the very best fiction writers who, to my mind, can figure out how to make questions that people wouldn't imagine imaginable to them. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly harder than, you know, uh, I would say the average historian in this sense is thinking harder, but not writing harder than the average non-creative nonfiction or fictional approach to the past. And yeah, so one thing you have done in your career is that you have written for a wider, for a wider audience with your work in the New York Times and the Atlantic and other forms of those uh, public mediums. Um, so I know, so I guess my question is, is that um, because you've done this, um, what has been your kind of experience talking to those types of people, the kind of feedback you've gotten? And then um, after that, we can talk about maybe what are some strategies that can be done to kind of get those things that we, you know, as academics, we write for other academics. How do we kind of, what are the strategies we can use to get that information out to the normal, like it's not the, the public, the wider public, like okay. K through 12, primary education, movies, literature. What's your thoughts on, on that? On yeah. So, I mean, I enjoy writing for wider public. You're always going to get, you know, a different range of responses. They're not confined by, you know, the limits of professionalism or whatever. Uh, so, you know, I remember I wrote something for the Times and the first uh, email I got in response said, uh, dear rich Yankee asshole. <laughs> uh, one out of three is not bad. Um, but, uh, you know, so you do get these, uh, you know, uh, and then sometimes you get questions that really seem to come out of the blue. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, people obviously have their goal to ask their question about something that obsesses them. And, and you know, what you're doing there is, is kind of irrelevant. Um, but I do think that uh, it's valuable, both personally, and, you know, whether it's schools that I talk at or community groups, um, you know, it's valuable to, to, to talk to people because of what we started with. And I know we're getting near the end. So it's what we started with, these myths. And these myths don't happen. You know, we can change the history books and yet not change the myth. So we have to figure out how, what are the ways that we can reach them, whether it's through talks, it's through op-eds, it's through, you know, seeing if we can engage in creative forms of public history, like the type that myself and my colleagues in the We Want More History group uh, did last September and we'll do again this September of doing history in public, of supporting things like national parks, of trying to engage with people in creative arts about making um, historically interesting interventions. Um, and so I think that that is really interesting and it's possible. There's different ways that it's possible depending on your format. Um, sometimes I think for historians, because we are obsessed with books, we turn to say, well, the best way I can do that is to make my book accessible to other people. And that I think can sometimes be a mistake, um, which is uh, I do think there's some value in holding to the idea that some of our writing is really for other academics. And it can happen on this level, uh, you know, and that's true of every other form of academic, right? Chemists, you know, don't apologize for writing for other chemists, right? I wouldn't know what the hell the heck they were saying, right? Like, yeah. if they're writing for me, they can't be advancing chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just reality. And I think we sometimes give up on the, we, we lose track or we surrender the idea that we need to be advancing history. I mean, not necessarily in those championing Blair the Trumpets. And that, that's really only going to happen at some level if we're talking to people who know where we are now. Mm. Um, the second is, I think a lot of people ruin their books um, by kind of neither feast, neither fish nor fowl. Uh, they take out the things that would really interest other scholars, but they don't take out enough to make it interesting to people who are actually sort of just avid popular readers. And you end up with these books that say they're reaching a broader audience and don't and end up making kind of ridiculous or overstated historical claims. And so I think that's something people, uh, you know, sometimes valorize that I don't. I think um, if you're trying to write for a public, the model is not the historian who sold the most books. The model is really looking at journalists. That's who people read way more than us. And they do a lot of things that we can't do. I don't mean in terms of facticity, right? But I just mean in terms of how you're, if you're thinking about to not even choose the sort of David McCullough or figure like that, but say Russell Shorter, books about New York and Amsterdam and stuff like that. These are historical books, but he's doing lots of things that we would never do. And in fact, the people claiming to write for a broad audience never do. And it may well be that that's because he knows things about how to reach people that we don't. And that's okay, but it seems to me that if you, that's your goal, that you should try to achieve it. And in fact, instead, what we get are these sort of hybrids that don't really help historians and don't really reach an audience, but do get a sort of one burst of newspaper reviews uh, and then get forgotten. And so I think a lot of times people have a chance to write a book that other historians will engage with a long time and end up writing a book that nobody engages with. And they get a slightly higher check and that's it. So I, I don't think uh, we gain anything by pretending that's good for anybody. No, it makes total sense. And then just kind of finish off this part. Um, we can write for popular. Most people don't read any books. Yeah. We want to write for popular audiences. It's not going to be by writing long books. Or make YouTube videos. <laughs> it's true, right? Make YouTube videos, you know? It's there you amazing. go. Straight up. That's awesome. Uh, so just really quick. Um, so just one question about uh, one article you I know statues and civil war statues are like the big thing when people talk about civil war and one of the big discussions we're having in the United States now. And I know you've written about uh, like reconstruction being a, a monument or being a, like a, a national monument or something to it to kind of explain those ideas. So um, one question I do have is that, um, so I was having a conversation with my family, another story. And so during the story, during this, we were talking about statues and I think what was happening was, you know, I think recently, they, no, of course, Civil War statues, all those should be taking other ones that are 
that continued the um the what's it called the the great lost cause, cause lost cause myth and stuff like that but um there's other statues being torn down like one recently that surprised me was like the statue of abraham lincoln and those other statues and so once dan told me you know why they were doing it i was like okay that makes sense and so but my family was really kind of against that idea and i was trying to tell them that there's certain reasons why certain statues should be pulled down because they're propagating a, a a myth that really did not exist or, and we should not continue to propagate those myths like keeping those statues up. But then the one thing that one person when my family was saying that like, at what point, I'll try to try to grasp my question as much as I can. So what they're trying to say was that, well, what's like the limit? Like where, like what statues can you not pull down? What statues can you pull down? And what their base idea is that they shouldn't pull, what they believe is that they shouldn't pull their statues down, that you shouldn't tear down like, History you should leave history as it is, is like one of them said. So I had my own per- point of view to that, but what would you say to someone who's saying that leave history as it is? Does that even make sense to you? So I think we have to understand that every act of memorialization, even the ones we like are acts of revision, of uh, you know, efforts to insert an idea um, that's, you know, they're, they're put up not because they're widely accepted, but because they're contested. Right. And this is true, you know, of all kinds of different statues um, that then, you know, later people take uh, take for granted. Richard White's got a lot about sort of how contested the memorialization of California was of Drake's Cross and so on, of people who thought that this was ridiculous. And then once it's there, it becomes a sort of, uh, you know, it's it's a piece of the past. So it's an argument that finds a platform. Um, so in that context, what we're doing is always in the verge of revision. Now, I do accept that there's a difference between revising by adding or building new and revising by tearing down, and that those should have very different thresholds or standards, right? It should be easier to build than to tear down. The problem is it's almost impossible to build, Mm-hmm. Right. Like uh, there's no money for it. There's no support for it. There's not, you know, there's uh, they're usually incredibly complicated processes. The decision to build the Maya Angelou statue in San Francisco is, you know, was approved something like seven or eight years ago. Still no statue. That's one that got approved. So, A, if you can't actually build anything new, then the question of, uh, you know, leave the past is very different. And that's one thing. Uh, if, you know, I think you could, you know, two, are there, can a society define for itself what it believes, or is it a prisoner of the political decisions of a prior society? And what happens if we look at the ways that prior society made its decisions? So if Southern states disfranchised black people and then a political system that only whites could participate in voted to memorialize these things, are we really required to be imprisoned by that? Mm-hmm. And we not reflect upon that? Mm-hmm. I would like ideally for those processes and I've written about this in San Francisco and other places for those processes, whether it's taking things down renaming, which is not like taking things down. Things get renamed all the time, right? Uh, you know, that to me seems a much lower threshold than taking things down. But for renaming, taking things down, choosing new things, that these are democratic processes, which I don't mean necessarily they all end in a popular vote, but they're inclusive because the goal is for people to learn. Your hope is people maybe change minds in all kinds of different directions, maybe become aware of things that help them see it differently, maybe simply become aware of how other people see it. White Southerners could really only live in, you know, sort of walking by statues of Nathan Bedford Forrest or you know, founder of the Ku Klux Klan or Confederate leaders relied upon deciding not to notice or care about the response of the black people who lived among them. As we said at the start, the South is a place where black and white people, not necessarily side by side, but in the same area all the time. And so these things like Jefferson Davis statue in in, uh, 
in New Orleans, uh, you know, in the edge of a, of a black neighborhood, you know, of, of many of these things being at the center of uh, some forest stuff in Memphis, uh, yet the edge or right in the midst of different black neighborhoods in Memphis. What's it mean for people to experience that? And I think we have to grant their perspective some meaning. To me, ideally, these enter into a public debate where people can talk about it. In fact, it, that seems from afar what had happened in Charlottesville when there was the decision to take down a statue and rename a park. It had been debated in council. People had come up. There had been different votes over the year. There was a shift in the council. There was a majority vote. So those people who showed up in Charlottesville, we, you, know, you will not replace us and so on, they're actually objecting to democracy. Right? to the idea that the people could choose. That seems weird to me. People, if people can choose, they're gonna make some bad decisions, but I can live with that if the process aims to bring people in. And if the process aims to think about not just what do we take away, but how do we think about what we do wanna memorialize? Because it seems to me we're completely failing at that question. And that to me, if you care about the past, and you're super worked up that we're failing to memorialize new things, and you have a difficulty in accepting taking down old stuff, that's not my view, but I can understand it. Yeah. yeah but if no, you don't yeah. care anything about that we're not doing any building of new memorials now on anything, and that we live in a society that's zero commitment to the past, and the only past you're committed to is these statues built in the 1890s, I think it says something. That's I, not a commitment to the past. That's a commitment to one sliver holding everything else in chains. I, now, sometimes you get a block on democracy. North Carolina banned its towns and cities from taking votes on their statutes. In that context, you know, People should operate, in my view, through democratic structures when they can. And if the democratic structures are set up to block them, I have less critique of people they are taking it down. To me, that's different than people taking down a statue in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. No one had tried to raise changing that. Taking it down was the first action. Taking it down in Durham was the last action after people had tried all these other things and it was about to succeed and they got stymied. To me, that's the difference between trying to persuade people versus not really trying to use a force of your own kind. Um, so I can accept that people, who, I, I do think you should have on principle an obligation to try to persuade others before tearing down as a first resort. That, yeah. And uh, if you're tearing down something you've never bothered to show up at a city council meeting to complain about, how committed are you actually to it? Um, but I think when, even though I'd rather things happen in a more organized structural way, when a society as, uh, you know, many Southern states started to block their majority or a large African-American population towns and cities from taking action, then I can't really, then I think it's much more open question. When should people just act? No, that makes total sense. I, I like that that question better better than what I said. That's for sure. But no, <laughs> uh, that's great, um, so, Professor. Uh, thank you for joining us. It was such a pleasure having you on and giving you giving us the time to you know talk to you and everything like that. It was such a great conversation. Um, so um, thank you for coming on. All right. Well, I'm really excited, and uh, these have been great questions. You all are doing really fun stuff and uh, look forward to it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. So everyone, we'll have another person on, but uh, it'll come out soon, and we'll talk to you guys later. So, ciao. Hey everyone, Eric here. If you enjoyed this podcast with Professor Downs, then be sure to check out the quick fire video we did with him. It'll be coming out soon, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification to be notified when the video comes out. Thank you.